Hi folks, this is Dr. Pickett. <clears throat> I just wanted to share with you guys a little bit of a technical background as we're thinking about the um, TGF beta molecules that are affected in individuals that are um, TGF beta receptor mutants in particular. So um, hopefully this is helpful to you. Let me know what you guys think. Um, I'm using a pretty low-tech <laughs> low approach, so uh, we'll see how this works out. Okay, <clears throat> so to begin with, when we're thinking about the TGF-beta ligand, there have kind of historically been two different ways to think about how this ligand might function. Um, you know, TGF-beta is released in kind of a protein complex from the cell. It then kind of hovers in the extracellular matrix for a while, follow-on processing, then allows free TGF beta dimer to be made available to the receptor, and then the receptor can signal. Because this is a very um, short range environment, there's been some question about whether TGF beta functions primarily in sort of informational homeostasis to kind of maintain the cell that produces the ligand, i.e., the cell producing the ligand. Um, then has that ligand interact with its own receptors. So in a way, the cell is measuring its own TGF beta signal. <coughs> when you have that type of signaling, we usually call that autocrine signaling. So kind of here, you can sort of see that highlighted. Um, that's a ligand secreted by a cell that's received by receptors of the same cell. However, we're also seeing that TGF-beta is acting as a ligand in situations where cells are incredibly close together. So, i.e., um, cells from different levels of the, the intima, the, the adventitious uh, tissue or smooth muscle tissue that's part of a vessel. So, if the producing cell is kind of pumping its own extracellular matrix full of TGF-beta, then from that pool of TGF-beta, the ligand leaks out into adjacent cells. We would say that would be a good example of paracrine signaling, where ligand diffuses over a fairly short distance. And I mean, I think in this case, we're really thinking about cell width or cell widths of distance from the source and the sink of the signal. Um, so this is really action at a very short distance. So with TGF-beta, I'll say at this point in the literature, there's good evidence for paracrine and there's some evidence for autocrine signaling as well. Um, so trying to understand exactly how it's working requires really good um, tissue level studies, and there's some cool things right now with, for instance, knockouts in mice <coughs> in smooth muscle cells where you're seeing um, either the receptor knocked out in one of a vessel cell layer and it's present in the other, and what we see is that cell layer by cell layer knockouts do have phenotypic effects, so that suggests that um, paracrine signaling is pretty well supported in a variety of different systems. So let's talk a little bit about um, how TGF-beta uh, is processed extracellularly. I mean, it is transcribed and translated as with any gene. The protein that is produced is, is referred to as a pre-pro protein. So there are two sequences that have to be removed. There's the signal peptide, which allows the protein to be secreted uh, from the cell through the secretory apparatus. And then um, there's another <clears throat> protein, excuse me, called latency-associated peptide, which is part of the same polypeptide that also contains the TGF-beta ligand. So actually, this, this protein has to be cleaved to remove LAP, or latency-associated protein, from the TGF-beta portion of the protein itself. They're still closely associated together, and it's interesting because two copies of this process protein 
come together to form what's referred to as the small latent complex. So you have two copies of latency-associated peptide, two copies of TGF-beta. The TGF-beta forms a dimer, and it's kind of nestled electrostatically within a little knot of this latency-associated peptide. Now, before the small latent complex is actually exported from the cell, it has to interact with a protein that's produced by an entirely different gene called the latent TGF beta binding protein. Now, <laughs> if we can get all this together, so we can get the latent TGF beta binding protein together, the TGF beta dimer, and the two copies of the latency associated protein, that kind of giant, you know, multimeric complex is referred to as the large latent complex. That is now ready to be exported from the cell. So I told you previously that this, you know, this molecular complex um, is accumulating in the extracellular matrix. How does that happen? Well, it turns out that regions on this um, latent TGF binding protein um, are able to associate electrostatically very closely with regions in an extracellular matrix protein called fibrillin. So what's fascinating about this is as the large latent complex is secreted, it kind of pumps into the extracellular space. There's kind of a snuggle up between latent TGF beta binding protein and fibrillin, and they form a very close association. So it's interesting, cells that are acting as signaling sources for TGF beta are just filling their ECM with this kind of inactive form where TGF beta ligand is hidden by the latency peptide, is hidden by the, um, <clears throat> by the large latent uh, uh, complex, and is literally kind of hooked into fibril. And one of my friends from graduate school always said that this was kind of a fun example of the sky hook. You, you, could, you can put a molecule out into space, but it doesn't freely diffuse because it's interacting with other protein components, in this case in the ECM. So you can create quite a very high local concentration, we believe, of the inactive form of this molecule. So it's quite awesome. So now, um, <laughs> then the logical question is, how do we ever get TGF beta out of this mess? Well, remember, it's, it's associated with the small latency complex, but it's not covalently bound to anything. It has electrostatic interactions. I, I think there are disulfide bonds that are involved, etc. So if you either have proteolysis of, of LAP, the latency-associated polypeptide, that will free TGF beta ligand, and then it can diffuse out of this mass of fibrillin and begin interacting with its receptor. There are a variety of other things, though. We know that temperature can help them disassociate. Changes, I, I know that historically changes in pH can help them disassociate, can help TGF beta disassociate. Also, we think that, I, I think it's the integrins. Some of the integrins can actually interact with LAP, change the conformation, and cause the sort of physical exclusion, the sort of spitting out of TGF-beta. So there are a lot of different processes that will free TGF-beta from this fibrillin-bound large complex. When that happens, it's available to begin to diffuse. It will diffuse into um, the extracellular media, whatever that might be. And then, as it reaches an appropriate concentration, will begin to partition onto the TGF beta receptors and will um, then activate them. Now, um, a really common class of protease, of protein digesting enzyme that will free TGF beta are some of the metalloproteases. Um, and there's a whole metalloprotease regulatory scheme. I mean, it's really amazing how many proteins care about how much TGF beta is produced or, or is released and available for interactions with receptors in real time. The local concentration of TGF beta 
is, is under a lot of different monitors. Now, <clears throat> one of the um, disease syndromes that are discussed in these papers is really, is really the classic connective tissue disease, Marfan syndrome. So it turns out that Marfan syndromes, they, all of these alleles end up being mutations in the fibrillin-1 gene, which produces this extracellular matrix protein fibrillin. Um, the alleles are fascinating. Some of them uh, allow fibrillin to be transcribed and translated, but not exported from the cell. Uh, some of the mutant alleles in Marfan's, I mean, there's a whole rate, there's a whole continuum of functional alleles associated with the Marfan's locus. And um, some of them are very specific amino acid substitutions, which just prevent the large latent complex from interacting electrostatically with fibrillin. But at the end of the day, what happens with Marfan's patients is fascinating. These individuals are heterozygous. Um, they're loss of function alleles. So the best explanation for this syndrome is that it is a haploinsufficient uh, type of trait. Um, two copies of fibrillin are needed to produce enough fibrillin protein in the ECM to appropriately capture uh, the latent form of TGF-beta. When the large latent complex fails to interact with fibrillin, that seems to destabilize it, and more free TGF-beta is released. Some of the um, traits associated with Marfan's, if we study them in tissue culture, they can be corrected by antibodies against TGF-beta. So um, a combination of different uh, evidences suggest that Marfan syndrome, and we'll talk a little bit more about the characteristics in class, but they're fascinating. These folks have everything from aortic dissection to long limbs. During development, they make collagen models and have bone growth problems later in development because of a difficulty organizing a well-organized extracellular matrix. They have a variety of developmental effects. Um, but we think at the end of the day, a lot of what's happening with Marfan's is too much TGF-beta signaling because there isn't enough um, sponge in the ECM absorbing that large latent complex, and thus too much TGF-beta is released in real time. And we'll talk a little bit later on about some of the cellular signals of having too much TGF-beta signaling because surprisingly, that's one of the take-home messages that you're going to see from these loss-of-function papers. The, the folks that we're looking at are going to be loss-of-function heterozygotes in aspects of the TGF-beta signaling network um, whose phenotype is very similar to Marfan's and whose molecular phenotype is very similar to Marfan's, suggesting that even though their loss-of-function um, mutants in the signal transduction cascade for TGF-beta, the phenotype that results from, from these individuals who are affected is caused by too much TGF-beta signaling, inappropriate TGF-beta signaling, rather than too little. It's quite a, it's quite a fascinating set of papers. So <clears throat> um, let's talk a little bit about the receptor side of TGF-beta. So um, it turns out that there is a heterotetrameric receptor that is required for normal TGF-beta signal response. So when the ligand accumulates, you end up forming or recruiting this heterotetrameric receptor. Um, two copies of the same receptor protein, the product of the TGF-beta receptor 2 gene called TGF-BR2, um, accumulate in their, their transmembrane protein, so they accumulate in the membrane of the cell. Um, TGF-BR2 is kind of a fascinating protein. It autophosphorylates kind of constitutively. It's a kinase. It's a uh, serine threonine kinase. So it adds phosphates to itself, and other kinases come in and add phosphate 
react to, to these receptors. So we usually see this as a homodimer kind of sitting in the membrane waiting for TGF-beta ligand to come along. So the phosphorylation state of this receptor homodimer is kind of probably less interesting from a regulatory perspective because it really seems like this guy's pretty heavily phosphorylated most of the time. Um, however, what happens when TGF-beta ligand comes along is really quite interesting because now when TGF-BR2 homodimer associates with the TGF-beta ligand, and remember it was formed as a dimer even before it was secreted from the cell, it stays as a dimer once it's released from the large latent complex. Um, once that interacts with TGF-beta receptor 2, it recruits two copies of the TGF-beta receptor 1 protein. So you end up having a initially homodimeric receptor becoming a heterotetrameric receptor with the recruitment of TGF-beta receptor 1 molecules by TGF-beta receptor 2 bound to the ligand. And it turns out TGF-beta receptor 2 has quite low affinity for TGF-beta receptor 1 except when the ligand is present. Now, what happens after that point? All of these are serine threonine kinase molecules is TGF-beta receptor 2 phosphorylates the two copies of TGF-beta receptor 1 that activates TGF-beta receptor 1 and makes it available to interact with other target proteins. So the ligand interacting with the receptor causes the formation of the heterotetrameric complex, which then becomes phosphorylated and activated so it can then target downstream proteins. Um, now, that leads us to the natural question. <laughs> you know, um, what are the intracellular targets of these kinases? So th this is a collection of proteins. I'll go into this a little bit more in class, but this is really a fascinating collection of sort of signaling intermediates. As a group, they're referred to as the SMADs, and the SMADs fall into two classes. One class is the receptor-activated or receptor-mediated SMAD. We call these R-SMADs, R for receptor SMADs. And um, for TGF-beta, the common SMADs are R-SMAD 2 or 3. You'll see that receptor-activated or receptor-mediated SMAD um, present in cells that are competent to receive TGF-beta signal. Um, once TGF-beta receptor 1 becomes phosphorylated and activated, our SMADs that are already in the cell but in an unphosphorylated state become phosphorylated. And when they become phosphorylated, they undergo a very interesting conformational change that exposes a um, short stretch of amino acids as a new electrostatic surface that allows the now phosphorylated receptor SMAD to interact with a new SMAD, which is referred to as a co-SMAD. Um, in, I'm trying to think in TGF-beta if there's, in almost every case, it's a protein referred to as SMAD4. So as long as the SMADs were phosphorylated by the receptor, a change in receptor SMAD conformation allows it to now bind to SMAD4. This heterodimeric complex is then able to translocate into the nucleus, and there it will literally interact with other transcription factors, aspects of the core transcription machinery, and activate the transcription of target genes. Now, we'll talk just a little bit about that in the context of this discussion. In class, we'll go into it quite deeply. Um, but we're already starting to see that we can 
take a little sneaky look into um, the TGF beta signal transduction cascade if we can do things like identify phosphorylated receptor SMAD or identify the mRNA or the protein from the genes that the SMAD heterodimer uh, regulates its transcription. It may positively or negatively regulate specific target genes. Um, also, we know there's a change in nuclear, uh, there's a change in subcellular compartment. Our SMADs go from being cytoplasmic to becoming nuclear uh, when they go from being inactivated to activated. So, you know, <laughs> Doc, Dr. Pickett and his uh, fascination with graphs, um, we can kind of think about these SMADs as undergoing quite a dynamic uh, set of interactions. They're, they're changing their post-translational modification. Either they are unphosphorylated or phosphorylated. And then they are also changing their cellular location, the subcellular compartment that they're in. Either they're in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. So we're really talking about um, pools of SMADs changing over time, pools of unphosphorylated and phosphorylated SMADs. But one of the things you'll notice from these papers is that the um, ultimate kind of total concentration of our SMAD is not changing. The same nanomoles of SMAD are present in the cell. It's just some of those nanomoles become partitioned into phosphorylated R SMADs, and some of those nanomoles end up being partitioned into the nucleus. So if we sort of think about what's happening to the R SMAD targets of phosphorylation by the receptor in, in real time, to begin with, we have kind of a steady state pool of R SMAD. You know, on the left, I'm just showing R SMAD in red. Um, if it is unphosphorylated, R SMAD in blue. If it is phosphorylated, the um, axis to the left will be the concentration of these various types of SMADs. The X axis is going to be over time. Before TGF beta signaling occurs, there's nanomoles of SMAD or picomoles of SMAD, of our SMAD in the cell, but none of it's really present or very low amounts of it are present in a phosphorylated state. However, once TGF beta ligand binds to the receptor and the receptor is activated, partitioning between these pools begins to occur the relative concentration of our SMAD begins to drop in real time, and that's because phosphorylated our SMAD begins to be seen in the cell. For every molecule of our SMAD interconverted into phospho our SMAD, um, there's, there's going to be an inverse change in terms of concentration as our SMAD unphosphorylated decreases in concentration, our SMAD that is phosphorylated begins to increase. At some point, that concentration of phosphorylated our SMAD is going to reach a level where it begins to associate and produce um, large numbers of heterodimers with the co-SMAD4, and the heterodimer will begin to partition into the nucleus. So it's kind of interesting. Here we're not going to see with the SMADs changes in real concentration overall of protein SMAD, but we're going to see changes in the amount of that protein that is phosphorylated and in the subcellular localization of the protein in the cell. We're going to see as, as receptor activation occurs, less SMAD cytoplasmically, more SMAD more phosphosmad nuclearly, along with its partner, the cosmad 4 So given what we've talked about now, I think you guys are empowered to kind of begin to take these papers apart and ask some questions of them. Um, a gene that is positively regulated 
by TGF beta receptor activation will be a gene whose transcription is increased as phosphorsmad and cosmad interacts with the cis regulatory binding proteins and stimulates the transcription of the associated gene. Genes that are negatively regulated by TGF beta receptor activity um, similarly will have less uh, uh, transcriptional activation and you should see less of their mRNA accumulating. Um, if TGF beta receptor has been activated, our SMAD should go from being non-phosphorylated to phosphorylated. So you'll see, for instance, there are some uh, Western blots you'll be looking at where there is an antibody that is sensitive to the phosphorylation state of SMAD. You're not going to see any signal in that Western blot until TGF beta activation has occurred because prior to that point, even though there is SMAD there, and there's SMAD on the blot. Since it's not phosphorylated, the antibody cannot detect it. And last but not least, our SMAD should, rather than being seen exclusively in the cytoplasm, if you can detect it, you're going to see phosphosmad in the nucleus. So these papers are going to be assessing things like tissue level responses, to TGF beta signal activation, and they're going to be asking questions about the informational state of TGF beta regulated genes and the actual um, phosphorylation state of um, the R SMAD and its uh, subcellular localization. So I hope that's a bit helpful. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, in a lot of my interactions with MAM students, um, folks express a certain amount of consternation because of the TGF beta receptor 1 and 2 mutants. Um, and, and I think the problem here is when you do automated sequencing, an automated sequencer always reports its data in the form of something called a chromatogram. So you're, you're sequencing through a DNA region, uh, T, T, C, G, T. That sequence from 5 prime, oops, I don't know if I can do that, to 3 prime is reported based on a series of fluorescence intensity peaks. So in this little stretch of DNA, which is, which is from the Rald H2 gene and zebrafish, um, in this little stretch of DNA from my lab work, uh, the 5' prime to 3' prime sequence is T, T, C, G, G, T, G, etc. And that's reported by little bursts of colored light based on the... Um, frequency of the laser that is illuminating your automated sequencing reaction. You get, and, and obviously this is false color, but you get a green burst, a green burst, a blue burst, a yellow burst, a yellow burst, a green burst, a yellow burst, a green burst, etc. And so that light flash is literally the signal that the automated sequencer is using and it's the intensity, the, the height of the peak and the area of the peak to do base calling and to assign a base identity to a specific position along the DNA sequence. So this is from an individual that's homozygous. So remember, fish, humans, <laughs> all vertebrates, everything except a sperm or an egg is, is diploid. So the signal that we're getting here from, from, from ground-up fish tissue um, is a signal that's produced by both homologs of DNA for this chromosomal region. Um, this individual is a homozygous wild type. So, yeah, just as a note, humans also are diploid. That means for any stretch of DNA along any chromosome, 
there is the possibility that a person could be heterozygous. Um, now, if you see that in a region that for other, um, from other experiments has been linked to a gene, the identification of heterozygosity at the DNA level, a heterozygous sequence at the DNA level, can indicate an allele that is associated with disease or causative of disease. So when we see one of these little peaks, what are we looking at? The sequencer is reporting the fluorescence, which is directly tied to the nanomoles or micromoles of DNA that were sequenced. So this signal um, is from two chromosomes. It's comprised of a bit of the signal from one homolog, a bit of the signal from the other homolog. Thus, here we're looking at the summed signal from two homologs. Now, I'm going to convert to just a little model just to give you guys a little bit of an idea about what happens when you don't have homozygosity, as is the case with both the de novo, the novel mutants that arose in TGF beta receptor 1 and 2, and also the alleles that are segregating in some of these families. So here again, we have just a, just a little region of DNA that's been sequenced. Um, if we look at, if we think about the flash of light that's being produced by, by laser, by laser induced fluorescence, we see a red flash, a red flash, a green flash, a yellow flash, blue, blue, then red. Um, based on the chemistry that's been used in the sequencer, in the sequencing reaction, the automated sequencer knows that that pattern of light flashes means the five prime to three prime sequence in this region is AATGCC. Um, the approximately same nanomoles of sequencing template was there for every part of this DNA. Thus, the flash that you get is of similar intensity throughout. So all of the peaks are basically about the same height. They're basically about the same width. When you have a heterozygote, however, you have an interesting phenomenon that occurs at precisely the nucleotide that is polymorphic, that is different between the two alleles that are present in a single person. What does that end up looking like from an automated sequencer perspective? Well, in this case, we have a situation where an individual, through most of the region of this chromosome, the individual is homozygous. For instance, five prime of the mutation, both of their homologs have an A present at the same uh, five prime position. Then one nucleotide three prime, both homologous chromosomes have an A. Another nucleotide three prime, oh, there's a T. But then they get to the fourth nucleotide in the sequencing reaction, and what do they have? They see a red flash and a yellow flash, but they're at half the intensity that you would expect in relation to the surrounding peaks. This is what we see when we have peak drop. This is always indicative of heterozygosity of some sort or hemizygosity. If you have heterozygosity, all of the nucleotides 5' prime and all of the nucleotides 3' prime will A, still be the same and will have the same intensity. If you have peak drop associated with hemizygosity, a deletion, all of the peaks 3' prime will have peak drop from that point on because the homologs will be different from every point after the site at which the deletion occurred. So in this case, we have peak drop. Um, the, the sequencer will report a simultaneous flash of yellow, a simultaneous flash of red, but at half the expected intensity, and it will report the sequence as um, uh, both anomalous and will try to call the same nucleotide at the same site. So it will report it something like this, A, A, T, G, A, 
CCA. That means at one nucleotide, there is both a signal for G and a signal for A. So signal from both of the alleles are seen, but at half the intensity in relation to any of the other bands 5' prime and 3'. Prime. Because the bands 5' prime and 3' prime are the same, um, this is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Fascinatingly, that can be enough. I mean, think about it. If that hits a codon, it changes the amino acid identity. Maybe it turns uh, a codon into a stop codon. If it's at a splice site, maybe now the mRNA is not spliced appropriately. So you're going to see with these, these TGF beta receptor mutants um, some single nucleotide polymorphisms, but they have an incredibly profound effect on the function of the receptor and on the health of those individuals that are heterozygous carriers. So basically that's it. I just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit more of a technical background, um, kind of identify sort of two areas where students have historically struggled. One is kind of just understanding the processing flow of information, um, why we don't see phosphosmad, then we do see phosphosmad, the other individuals have struggled over time just with um, un understanding what they're seeing with DNA sequence. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. Um, I will be back probably late Friday afternoon. So, you know, feel free to send me emails if you guys have questions. And next week we'll have the normal recitation on both Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and we'll also begin going through some of these papers as I complete uh, organogenesis and the discussion of the chick wing. Um, have a good day, my friends. Cheers.